Now, uh, we left off um, by talking about uh, the, the medical profession and medicines and so forth. And again, as I say that, you, we've had these studies before. Of course, if you were to ask me, um, uh, what should I do for a headache? I'd tell you, take two aspirin and call your doctor in the morning. You know, um, don't, don't you ever go uh, saying that I said, uh, just, just trust in the Lord. If you've got something serious, you should go to a doctor. You should take your medicine because that's the norm for, for this dispensation. The exception to the rule is we can pray for people and God sometimes will raise them up. But I'm, I'm telling you that, um, that, uh, the expected thing of us is uh, to learn, of, of grace believers, is to learn to deal with the ups and downs of life by means of God's grace. And physically, it's not always going to be easy. Now, I wish I, I had good news to tell you. But actually, the good news is um, uh, grace has dynamics to see you through. Uh, but I was pointing out an observation. People would sell their soul for health. And the fact is, Jesus Christ is going to provide all of us eternally good health if we'll just trust him as our Savior and he'll give us a resurrection body. It's not going to be now, but it's going to come that way. And there is a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of deceit, I, I think, uh, in, in uh, those uh, particular uh, fields and, and the like. Uh, but there's a lot of good, of course. We appreciate those who have, who have found vaccines. We don't have polio. We don't have the, the measles. We don't have these other things because people work to provide us health, and we're appreciative. But on the other hand, this was in this week's paper. Uh, and, um, and as I was going down, I saw it, and I thought it was an ad for a travel agent. It's a sandy setting with, a, you know, a, it looks like a, a fallen banana tree here, palm tree, what, what have you. Uh, and it has a, on it what is obviously um, an international model. Um, and uh, she, is, she is slender, she's in a bikini, and so forth. And, then, and I looked at that thing, and it said, tumescent liposuction. And so you get to reading how, many, how much uh, down and how much a month uh, to get this, and you read where it is and so forth. But then down at the bottom, now to show you, th this gal is skinny, she's slender, you know, and obviously attractive. Down at the bottom, four words say, not an actual patient. Not an actual patient. Now, if that is not deceptive, I do not know what it, you know, it's not a before and after type deal. It is, it catches your eye, and you think, you know, that you're going to go to this guy, and you're going to be some international model once he's through with you, but it's not true. He got somebody that was already that way genetically uh, to, to pose. That is deceptive. But um, anyway, we're under the heading of biblical uh, proof. Oh, well, I thought I was going to go back to my old bodybuilding days and just buy my way out, I guess. I don't <laughs> Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Psalms 103 uh, and uh, verse number three. We're under the heading of biblical proof that there's healing in Christ's atonement. Now, one of the verses that is a proof text for those that are healers is uh, Psalms 103.3, who forgives all thine iniquities, who heals all thy diseases. So, uh, you'll note how the two are joined together there, that um, when iniquities are forgiven, uh, d diseases are non-existent. But you have to remember this in light of your lifespan, and, and even the lifespan of, of uh, uh, those who wrote the Psalms. Think of David. What a great man he was. But did David have his frailties? Yes. Did David get old? Absolutely. Did David die? He's, yes. The Apostle Peter said, men and brethren, the sepulcher of David is with us to this day. And his body turned to dust is in it. 
And then, but then he pointed to Christ. David, being a prophet, said that his body, his son's body, would not suffer corruption. And it didn't. But did David's? Yes. What does that mean? David got sick and David died, and David couldn't keep body and soul together, and David couldn't keep cell to cell together. He is a, has a disintegrating body that is in a grave in, in Jerusalem. So you have to remember these things in light of, of the overall picture. We are going to have all our diseases healed when we don't sin anymore. That's the whole point. Who, who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. Now, think, of, think with me a, a minute. Um, are, do you expect to have all your diseases forgiven in the body that you now have? And you should say, no. Why? Because you're not done sinning yet. <laughs> I heard a giggle from the peanut gallery. <laughs> yes. Potentially, Jesus Christ died to forgive us all of our sins. But as long as we're in this body, guess what? We're not done sinning yet. And the associated sicknesses that come as a result of sin are going to be in our body. Now, what does that mean? It means that we're not going to have all diseases healed until we have the potential not to sin anymore. When and where in all of your lifespan and history is that going to happen? It's not until the resurrection and their old sin nature is eradicated. When that's removed, when things are different in your body, when you no longer have that propensity to sin, then you no longer are going to have uh, sicknesses. The two go hand in hand. When all iniquities are forgiven, all diseases are healed. Uh, so uh, once again, in light of in light of seeing things in the, uh, this way, the uh, healing in the atonement is not applied until the resurrection. Now let's note a couple other proof texts. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Now, I'm just going to uh, give you this uh, next verse uh, for those who are taking notes, but it is the uh, so-called New Testament version of this. The Apostle Peter quotes it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And uh, it um, is verse 5 here, uh, but it's 1 Peter 2, 24 if you want to look it up. It says the same thing, but uh, what we want to look at is the tense the grammar. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Apostle Peter says, by his stripes we are healed. Now, that's healing in the atonement. When Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgressions, something else was happening. Uh, and that was he was dying for sin in the flesh. He was dying so that um, uh, there might be a motto, a paradigm, where, uh, where God can say, well, look here, this guy doesn't have an old sin nature, and I want everybody to be uh, like him. And that's, uh, that's the way it's going to be. Now, in this particular case, Rapha is the, um, is the Hebrew, um, where we have a Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee. There's, there's a holism there. There's a, a systemic healing there. Uh, from the core of man outward, we're talking about healing. Uh, okay. I heard another giggle from the peanut gallery, but I, I wasn't. <laughs> All right. Uh, where, where are we? But, and with the by his stripes, we are healed. So it, it comes from in and out uh, as far as um, this, uh, this word is concerned. Nifal perfect, anytime you have the perfect tense, it refers us back to a time when a transaction was complete. Uh, when was our salvation package finished? When Jesus Christ said, it is finished, and the perfect tense of tetelestai. It was done then, when he said those words, it's done. 
Uh, the salvation package is complete. I, I, uh, I performed everything necessary for the salvation of man. He bowed his head and then he died. Okay? So it was done when he said that. A completed uh, transaction. Here it's in the perfect tense. It takes us back to when he was wounded at the cross. But uh, the nifel is reflexive. And it means that it looks forward to a time when it happens. You have the potential here at the cross. You have the actual uh, in, in a later time. When is that actual? The time of the resurrection transformation. So potentially we are healed in our body. But again, just like that verse, when all your iniquities are forgiven, then all your diseases are healed. So you're healed here with the removal of the old sin nature, but it reflects us back and says, the potential for that was when Jesus Christ died. Now, the same thing is true uh, in, uh, in the uh, book of 1 Peter. That's in the culminative aorist tense, aorist tense point of time. But the culminative aorist looks at a thing in its entirety and views it uh, as an existing result. Here's when it happened, point of time, aorist, culminative. It accumulates to a point where here is where it actually happened. You have the potential, you have the actual, and it brings us right back to, to that particular point. So is there healing in the atonement? The answer is yes, but when is it applied? Here's when it happened, but it's applied at the resurrection. Okay, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And we'll start at verse number 14. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and uh, sick of a fever. Now, just let me stop here and get on a little rabbit's trail. Um, Roman Catholic Church, uh, celibacy of all the popes. First Pope, Peter. Uh, it's interesting here that Peter's wife's <laughs> uh, mother, it was his mother-in-law that Jesus Christ healed. Uh, so uh, for those uh, uh, popes uh, who go trace their um, uh, popery back, not popery, <laughs> popery, back to Peter. Uh, Peter had a wife. He touched her hand and the fever left her. When even was come, verse 16, they brought unto him many that were possessed of devils, cast, uh, and he cast out the spirits, healed all that were sick. Mind you, uh, he did not say, okay, I've touched you now, but in about six months you're going to get cured. Uh, I've touched you now, and this is going to get better, and that's going to get better. He healed them, and sometimes he uses the word immediately. He touched them, boom, they were healed immediately. They didn't have to wait for it. Um, they, they left the service, as it were, healed completely. But here's where there's healing in the atonement that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. There is healing there. But again, you have to understand that when Jesus came the first time, he was giving credential signs. And those signs were healing signs. By the way, um, there's, there's so much emphasis on this. Do you know that these were not the only credential signs he gave? And we have often, uh, we've often uh, said this. What, um, what else uh, did Jesus do? Well, uh, here's a good one. He went to a wedding and they were out of the sauce. And uh, his mom came to him and said, we, we need a little more wine. And Jesus said, okay, dip it out. And he turned the water to wine. And it was the first miracle he performed publicly, it says there, there in the book of John. And um, it's all this emphasis on something that's vague, something that has gray areas, something that's nebulous, that's something that's not quite sure. It's something you can't, you can't put your finger on, uh, uh, and, and they were healed. But it's nothing like, once water, now wine. Now, perform the things that were done in the Bible. Exactly. I mean, Jesus said, greater works than these you'll do because I'm God to my Father. If you'll just do the works he did, you'll convince me, but there's not a one of them that can duplicate the miracles of the Bible. And uh, that is um, 
uh, the point we're making. Did he take our infirmities? Yes. But even the people that he healed at that time got sick and died. It was a temporary gift, performed a temporary miracle that was not meant to totally alleviate sickness in the life of the one healed under the dispensation of law. Now, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, take us here uh, to another point in the outline uh, I've got. We'll have these as handouts uh, uh, someday in the future. But um, let's turn to Matthew 14. We'll go here and then we'll go to Romans 8 and then come back at another time. And Matthew 14 and in a moment we'll start at verse number 23. Since, since I went down the, this list here with um, they're not doing everything. God did not limit his credential gifts to healing. God did not limit his credential gifts to signs. I mean, excuse me, to, um, to tongues. As a matter of fact, do you know that Jesus Christ never spoke in tongues? <laughs> Interesting thing. Oh, we've got to be like Jesus. We've got to speak in tongues and go through all. Jesus Christ didn't speak in tongues. He, ne he never did. Uh, that happened subsequent. And the, the disciples that followed him during his public earthly ministry never spoke in tongues until after he was ascended and the Spirit of God came. And that was in keeping with the Great Commission to call Israel home and start, uh, start the kingdom. So uh, the emphasis, I, I, you just cannot believe it, it is a spirit of darkness that has fallen on Christendom uh, today where you, you just can't seem to break through with facts here historical facts this is how it happened this is this is how it came to be anyway one thing with regard to these folks is if you're going to talk about healing then you have to talk about adjunct things things that are associated with healing now not one of them today is miraculously controlling nature so as to prevent bodily injury Think of the verse of scripture, the angelic guardianship. Uh, Satan told the Lord, jump off the temple. Well, of course, that was, that was an, ex the, he wanted him to stretch that verse. But the verse does say, he's going to give his angels what? Charge over thee, lest at any time you what? Dash your foot against a stone. You're not going to have a stubbed toe uh, under this concept because God's going to take care of you. You're not going to have pain. You don't have to, you don't have to nurse the, your big toe because it's bruised. You don't have to hobble along because we're going to prevent it from happening. Matthew chapter 14, verse number 23. He sent the multitudes away, went up to the mountain to pray. Evening was come. The ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. The disciples saw him walking on the sea of trouble. They thought it was a spirit that cried out in fear. Jesus spake to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it's I, be not afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be you, bid me uh, uh, to come to thee on the water. Come, said the Lord. Peter was uh, come out of the ship. He walked on the water to Jesus. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. He began to sink, and he cried, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, uh, O thou little faith, and uh, when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Now, what did he do? Jesus Christ walked on that water. He rescued Peter from, from what? He rescued him from a boisterous sea by doing what? Uh, calming the sea and enabling him to walk on that water. Now, if we're going to say that they have the power to heal bodily, then we must also say that there are associated things. There, you must have the power to prevent injury. You must have the power to control nature, to control storms, uh, to prevent these things from, from happening. Do believers get caught in storms? Uh, do believers get flooded? Dear God, thank you for... <laughs> Uh, we haven't been lately. Uh, you almost want to say thank you for the drought, but uh, no. But you have to have that power. They don't have that power. Matthew, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Mark chapter 4.
Mark chapter 4. And verse number 36. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. Now before, remember, he was... Uh, he sent them across, and, and he went uh, alone, and he came walking on the water uh, out uh, to them. Uh, that, that would probably today would drive any uh, uh, travel agent crazy, you know, cruise people. Okay, walk out to the ship. Uh, and when they had sent away the multitude, they took him as he was in the ship. There were also other ships. There arose a great storm. Waves beat the ship so that it was now full. He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Awake him, master, carest thou not that we perish? He arose and rebuked the wind into the sea, peace be still. You see, the boats were filling up. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now, what, what are we saying here? We're saying that with the gift of healing also came the gift of protecting bodily harm. They do not have that particular gift. None of them can prevent uh, life from closing in on them and eventually uh, harming them. You, you, know, uh, you know what happens? Um, uh, uh, for example, if you've got little kids and uh, little kids fall and scrape their knee or they, they cut themselves on a finger, those same ones, which, which did not prevent that, uh, by the way, didn't prevent the, the finger being cut, didn't prevent the knee from being scraped. Those same ones that say that they've got the gift of healing will say, come, let daddy kiss it, come, let mommy kiss it. It's a boo-boo. You spray it with a little bit and put a Band-Aid around it. And you think to yourself, oh, wait one second here. If they've got the gift of healing, and they just, uh, yeah, and they're, you know, <laughs> why would you have to do this? Why didn't you just keep it from happening to begin with? Why didn't somehow you make the concrete soft so that they landed on a, uh, on a, a bed of roses, uh, on a mound of hay, and so forth? No, because they cannot prevent the harm from happening. That's another dispensation. That's another time. Okay, Matthew chapter 8. I like this point. Ma uh, Mark chapter 8. See, if we had the gift of healing and it was applied in the atonement, um, my brain wouldn't be going as bad as it's going. Mark chapter 8, verse number 1. Now, here is a situation where we have a crowd of people coming and uh, all of a sudden they got taken up with the Lord Jesus Christ and they left their home without food, all right? Now, uh, hunger, especially after you haven't eaten for a couple of days, can, can cause one to be weak, frail, and as Jesus says, a faint, faint in the way. In those days, verse 1, the multitude being very great, having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude. They have been now with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away fasting to their own houses, they'll faint by the way, for different ones have come from afar. Again, naturally, they didn't have what we have today. Uh, um, every exit on the interstate has a fast food place. You know, uh, every corner has a, has a a marathon station or a, one of those type of deals. Uh, as a restaurant, you can always get food pretty much anywhere. Now, these people were on and they couldn't get food and they didn't have it. Must have slipped their mind. His disciples answered, from whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, how many loaves have ye? And he said, seven. I remember there, there were different times where you had the little lad with the five loaves and two fishes. This is a, another time. With this forgetful multitude, my goodness, they're planning to be with the Lord at this, this great campaign. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, he brings them right out to, to the wilderness, and there's no food around. He commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took seven loaves and gave thanks. And they uh, did... Um, uh, set before them, they did set the people. Uh, be, they did set them before the people, 
and they had a few small fishes. He blessed them and commanded to set them also before them. And so they did eat and were filled, took up of the broken meat of seven baskets full. For they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. So the other says it was 5,000 men plus women and children with the five loaves and two fishes, but here's the other. Uh, the other. In, in coordinating these things, he said, if I send them away, they're going to faint. They have not, had no food. They are bodily now in a critical situation. If I send them away, some of them have a long way to go back home to get any food. They're going to faint. Some of them may perish in the way. So what am I going to do? Well, in keeping with this idea of providing, controlling nature in the first place, and then providing for the health of another in the second place, what did Jesus do? He multiplied the loaves and the fishes. Well, they'll say, I'll, I'll tell you what, we multiply it all the time. We've got, we've got money and we've got food drives and so forth. And uh, anytime people need to eat, we just go to the pantry and we serve them. No, 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 no. Wait one second here. That's not how Jesus did it. Do you know what he did? He took one loaf of bread and from that, that one loaf of bread, he made another loaf of bread. That's the miracle I want. I want you to perform the miracle Jesus did. He didn't send his disciples to town to pick up some more bread at the local store. He took that bread and he multiplied the bread. Not only did he do that with the bread, he did it with the fish. And they were in the wilderness. He couldn't drop a line or pull the net. Now, perform that kind of miracle. I mean, actually take a loaf of bread and make two. I'll take the other one. That, that's, uh, that's fine. Uh, make three. Feed us all. From that one loaf of bread, it was not money buying other loaves of bread to feed people. It was transforming food into food for people to eat. No one is doing that today. And by the way, they did it to keep the people healthy. They'll faint in the way. What am I going to do? Okay, let's look at John. John chapter 11. And we'll start with verse number 37. The ultimate manifestation of sickness is death. The ultimate manifestation of healing is resurrection. Uh, since we're taking the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and we want to duplicate his miracles, okay, that's what we're doing. They didn't have refreshment at a wedding. He turned water to wine. Let's do that. No one is doing that. Okay? There were storms that were about to peri about to kill people. They were perishing in the sea. What did he do? He came and he calmed the storms. He controlled nature. There were people that were about to perish because they were hungry. There was no way to feed them except one, and that was to turn bread to bread to bread and fill up baskets full afterwards, not by buying it, but by duplicating it on the spot. All right? Now, here's a situation where I told you the one guy, he's out of the ministry now, by the way, he's had some difficulties. But uh, there are people here, Miss Lucy will, will know the guy I'm talking about. I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, she's had people to, to follow this man. And uh, he talked about the fact that he raised somebody from the dead. And the situation was there was some guy on a gurney who evidently was in the hospital and he came and prayed for him and the guy came too and he said he raised him from the dead. You know, he was all, all shut down and, and the like. And I always talk, told this guy, teased him. I, I, I razzed him because he had bifocals. He was balding. He, he had, um, he had um, a little pooch here, a, a bay window. And, 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 his, and he had an injury and he walked... <laughs> And he walked with a limp. And I would always say, you know, you're the only preacher in town that has bifocals, balding, bulging, walk with a limp, and you raise people from the dead. You know, I don't think he ever did get, he never did stop trying to, to raise people from the dead. But see, this business of going into a hospital and touching people who have just passed away, <laughs> Oh, did you hear it? They've made a noise, you know, oh, and so forth. They don't understand that until 
you know, they're dead and, and taken care of. Uh, I mean, uh, until they're taken care of, that the, the body does have its twitches and its turns and so forth and makes its noises. What I want to do is for them to duplicate the miracle of Jesus Christ. Call a man from the grave after he's been embalmed and after he's been there four days. Now we're talking a major miracle here. Now, now, okay, fine, let's, uh, uh, you convince me. What did Jesus do? John chapter 11, verse number 37. Some said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that this man should not have died? Like, yeah, sure he could have. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, comes to the grave. I, I like that, because I've done a lot of groaning in the course of my ministry. When people don't get it sometimes, and, and, you just sit there and go, hmm, and that's what he was on, groan, groan, muttering. It was a cave, and a stone lay on it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said, Lord, by this time, he stinketh. He's been dead four days. Decomposition is now occurring. Big mistake. Don't you dare open that tomb. Because uh, we're going we're gonna to offend all of our guests here. This is not the right thing to do. Jesus said to her, Said I not to thee that if you would believe, you'd see the glory of God. They took away the stone, the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that you've heard me. I know you always hear me because of the people who stand by. I've said this. He was giving credit to the power of the Father. When he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Now, mind you again, many commentators point out this fact, and, and, uh, and I think it's cute and, and right. He, he was in a graveyard, but he had to specify which one he wanted to come. Why is that? Well, if he had just said, come forth, he'd have had a whole lot of bodies on his hand. <laughs> uh, you know, come forth. Whoa, wait, wait, I just wanted Lazarus here. He specified Lazarus, come forth. He would have raised the whole kit and caboodle. The whole bunch would have been coming up here. But Lazarus was dead and decomposing, and he raised him. That's the kind of miracle I want to see these people do. But it's, it's always these questionable things. Well, I touched him and he made a noise. Or, uh, or supposedly they're clinical dead, clinically dead. How many unbelievers have been in that state and doctors come in there and turn it around and bring them back to life? How many unbelievers, they've been brain dead. And uh, sometimes I think their heart's beating fine. It's like the guy in the, in the I like this one here. A uh, guy in the thing we, we put in the bulletin here. The wheel is turning, but the hamster is dead. That is classic. <laughs> you know, you want to say, hello, anybody in there? And, then, and that's what happened. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot in grave clothes, his face bound with an app, loose him and let him go. There, there is a healing miracle I want to see him perform. But they cannot do that, of course. All right, let's uh, go back to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And we'll start with them um, here in a moment with verse number 50. Um, I had uh, seen a lot of uh, war movies in the past, and of course, uh, being a man, I guess that's a man thing, uh, liking war uh, movies and the like. Don't want to, don't want to be in a war, but um, but you you see people who have stood the test between other peoples who want to subjugate, conquer, murder, uh, pillage, and and so forth. But war is, is not a pretty sight, and I uh, saw uh, uh, the film, uh, eventually, uh, that of Saving Private Ryan. Uh, and of course, you know my admiration for the World War II uh, generation, and um, Tom Hanks is right. 
bunch of common people saw the need, dedicated themselves to that task, and gave life and limb for it. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant uh, as far as seeing, but, but, but uh, understanding what they went through is, is, um, is sometimes uh, important. And you would see guys there with arms blown off, um, legs blown off, uh, in, in the midst of horrendous circumstances um, and, and the like. Now, the point that I'm, I'm making here is that happens in life. We've all known people who have had uh, amputations, who have had accidents and the like, where an arm, a hand, a, a leg is, is taken. But you know something? It's, it's always quite interesting to me that in the so-called healing services of these faith healers, we don't find anybody like that there. Have you ever noticed? Uh, we don't find anybody with a limb missing that is reattached and healed. All of the nerves are connected back. All of the veins are connected back. All of the, the uh, ligaments, uh, everything necessary is connected right back. In an instant of time, it grows back, and they're able to use that severed limb. But we don't ever find that. Yeah, you you ask people, okay, well, hey, I'll, I'll be there, you know. You will provide, I'll, you know, as a matter of fact, we'll go find somebody that is in, has this condition because I'm sure they would want to correct it and we will heal them. Now, they're going to say, well, they don't have faith to be healed. They're an unbeliever. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a Bible example of someone who was an unbeliever that Jesus touched with a severed limb and healed him immediately. He didn't have faith to be healed. Jesus touched him and healed him immediately. Malchus is his name. Doesn't give that here, but um, we're told that in other portions. One of them is the Apostle Peter who, who did it. Uh, smote the servant of the high priest. Peter took out his sword and note, cut off his right ear. Peter is known as the impetuous apostle, and he was always acting when he shouldn't, talking when he shouldn't, doing things when he shouldn't, and he got in trouble for it, and so he had to, to back off and, and correct. Uh, and so in this particular situation, it was too late for him. He had cut the guy's ear off. Now, uh, these are the miracles we want to see these people perform. Note what Jesus did. He answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. In other places he said, look, Peter, I told you to get a sword, but I didn't mean for you to use it now. I've got to get to the cross, and uh, you know, if we're going to fight our way out of here, uh, then there's, I'm not going to get there. Just uh, put your sword back in its sheath. But he touched his ear and healed him. We don't, as, as I am mentioning all of these things, we don't have anybody today performing Bible miracles. No one. The miracles that I just gave, if they'll just do these, we'll say, okay, fine, we, we give. But they don't. It's always questionable. It's always, well, boy, I, I just wonder about that. Romans chapter 8. This is, we'll, we'll mention some things here. This is where we'll start next time. Because we're just about out of time. And we'll start with verse 16. Why do we start in verse 16? It says this. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children, the born ones of God. Okay, this is Romans 8, 16. And that's what it says. So what? What does that have to do with this matter of healing? Well, you will uh, look at verses 17 and 18 here because this verse is the prelude. It's the introduction to what Paul is going to, to be dealing with. What is that? The sufferings of this present time. If you're children, if you're born one, then you're heirs. If you're heirs uh, uh, with Christ, 
Um, if so be that we suffer with him, that we might be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Verse number 16 evidently is given in light of the fact of sufferings. If I'm the child of God, why am I going through this, you see? And evidently, evidently the Apostle Paul here in using this phrase to introduce the sufferings of this present time is telling us, okay, look, things are going to look pretty bad in your life at, from time to time, uh, but there's somebody that's going to keep witnessing to you that you're a child of God and that you are saved and uh, that it's, everything's going to be okay. Now, I've got the perfect illustration for this. Just happened yesterday. I was studying my little computer and, you know, getting all this uh, ready. And all of a sudden, I get a phone call. The guy says, Pastor Denny Walters? Didn't recognize the voice. Said, yes, sir. He said, this is Brent Chambers. And I said, hello, Brent. <laughs> I didn't know him from Adam, you know. He said, you led me to the Lord in August of 1982. He said, don't you remember? And I said, Brent Chambers. I said, yeah, you were the guy who came up to me at the pit and asked me some questions at the water. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's me. He said, uh, he said, I'm saved. He said, I've been living for the Lord. He said, but... Um, he said, I got out of fellowship, and he said, I've been wondering sometimes if it really took. That's a perfect illustration, say. And I went through with him again, the plan, did, did we do this? Yes, I knew what to do, because I have a standard thing that gets a person to a point where you either do or you don't, in reality, in your heart. And he said, yes. And then he went, and I could hear the sigh of relief. He's, he lives in Lexington, Kentucky. He said, from that point on, I, I lived for the Lord, I moved away, went to school, and so forth. And he said, I just want to be assured and so I could hear him with the relief. Oh, he said, I feel so much better. I feel better than I did an hour ago. So here he was, 1982, he moved out of town after he got saved. It stuck with him, but he got departed from the Lord, and he just needed a little re reassurance that what he had done really was true. And that. Um, so I'm going to give him to Brother Finley Hunter, who, looks over there, uh, who lives over there in Lexington, to to follow up on him because he needs to be in a grace church studying the word that's why he doesn't have the security of his salvation and so forth but the point that i'm making here is that paul says there is somebody in us oh uh, uh, he was going through some difficulties in life that's what ma was making him reassess and if i'm really if i'm going through these difficulties am i really saved and so forth the point of this verse sometimes we get in life difficulties and we just need the assurance. So Paul's about to enter in a, a, a whole list of verses where he talks about our sufferings this present time. And the first thing he does though is tell us, if we go through it, the Spirit of God is gonna keep on witnessing to us that yes, we are the children. This is technon as opposed to we us, the born ones of God. And if we're born ones, then we're heirs. If so be that we suffer with him, verse 17, that we might be also glorified together. And I'm going to uh, comment on this verse, and we'll take up on it later. What did Paul just say with regard to our sufferings with him? That a grace age believer must be left open, must be made vulnerable to the sufferings of this life or else there's no glory to come. Well, there's minimal glory in a glorified body, but as far as going through it, God must have his witnesses that yes, I went through hell in a physical condition uh, that, that was detrimental, that was unhealthy, but I depended on his grace. And the apostle Paul is saying that we suffer together with Christ. And here's the upshot as we close. Jesus Christ never had an old sin nature, so Jesus Christ never suffered the maladies that, that we suffer, except on the cross as they were poured out. But Jesus Christ is alive in us. We are his body, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And God the Father needs to have his son, a testimony to his son, with regard to handling the pains and trials of this life with a sin nature. Couldn't do it in this body, but he does it in a second body. Uh, that um, will be a testimony that anything that is thrown our way, we can handle by the grace of God. 